for coming along to this session on cultural awareness in the school community. Um, my name is Jane Clinton. I am an EA, EAL Leader of Learning and I'm with my colleague Christine McCormack, who's also an EAL Leader of Learning um, in Glasgow City Council. So this evening we're going to talk about um, cultural awareness and the importance of that in terms of our learners and supporting our families in schools. So um, first of all, I'd like to um, identify a little bit about what we um, see in happening in Glasgow schools. We're going to talk about the definitions of cultural awareness and we're going to look at some ways that um, parents can support with that within the school community as well. So first off, what is cultural awareness? OK, so um, I'm going to read some of what's on the screen, but we're also going to add to that as we go through this presentation. So cultural awareness is that ability to understand, respect and appreciate different cultures um, central part of living and working um, and cultural diversity enriches our communities and, and fosters that inclusivity. So within the Glasgow context, we have about 131 different languages spoken within Glasgow and almost 25% of the learners in Glasgow um, don't have English as their first language. And that's just one example of some of the diversity within our, our own city. Um, and, and a lot of our learners are moving between um, several different different cultures at once, and we're going to explore that in just a wee moment. So again, I think just it's important to look a bit more closely at the definition of cultural diversity. Um, so I'm just going to give you a wee second to have a look at that slide. Well, let me go back. Excuse me. There we go. Um, so the definition and some examples um, of cultural diversity and some things that we would maybe notice. I think it's important when we um, think of cultural diversity, we consider how communities do work and exist together. Um, and I think the examples here of religion, food, communication styles, and um, some of the things that are taboo in a culture, ethics and language are very important and there, some of them are very obvious. There are other things that are more subtle around cultures um, that perhaps take us by surprise sometimes. Um, many people step into different cultures multiple times a day and have learned to navigate this successfully. And a lot of the time we find our children able to do that very, very well. We've also got to remember, though, that when we identify with a culture or someone is within a culture, um, identity and the concept of identity is also quite fluid for some people. And it can change depending on many things in life, such as age, language, economic circumstances, for example. So when we consider culture and cultural awareness, um, and within the school context, we're often thinking about exactly these things, religion, food, communication, language, um, a sense of belonging. Um, so many, many things that, um, that contribute to cultural identity and therefore need to be considered within cultural awareness. So um, within the Glasgow context, we work very closely with lots of schools. Um, we've recently been doing a lot of work um, looking at anti-racism and it's actually been through that work that um, a lot of schools have also been looking at how to respond well to um, the diverse learners within their school community. And it's becoming a culturally responsive school. That is the goal for many schools and some schools are further along that journey than others. Um, but again, I want to quickly talk about um, what does a culturally responsive school look like? What are going to be some of the signs that you may see, either as a parent or a carer within the school community? What are some of the things you could perhaps suggest if you were at a parent council meeting um, that you'd like to see happening because you want to see a more culturally diverse community created. So in a culturally responsive school, learners will have the opportunity to research, share and celebrate their diverse ethnic backgrounds. So gone, long gone are the days when we ask learners not to use their first language or to speak about maybe somewhere they've been or maybe somewhere their family has, has lived for a while or if it's a child that's come recently into the country you know we're encouraging them to, to tell us about their world that they've come from. Long gone are the days when we are um, wanting children to become almost Scottish as soon as they arrive in, the, in this country. So here are some of the signs um, that are visible around cultural awareness that are probably quite obvious um, and are, would hopefully be some of the things that parents would see around the school community. Um, so our language is known and celebrated. So do you see your language at the front door, perhaps? Maybe on a sign, a welcome sign? Are there QR codes that can be scanned that you maybe receive a welcome in your first language? Has a school asked about your first language? L lots of these things. And a lot of schools are doing this very well. When you go to um, 
um, maybe parental involvement, parental engagement sessions, or um, even teach meets or whatever you're going to. Um, it's hospitality, um, catering for your needs. So have the school thought about, um, and I, I suppose I'm going to consider maybe um, people who are halal right now, have had the school chosen some of the, have the cho- school chosen snacks that are appropriate for the learners and for the parents that are going to meet their needs at that time. So again, that's just part of this cultural awareness and culturally responsive school. Um, do learners see themselves reflected in the school? Has the school gone beyond just having a corner where maybe they have books that would be categorised as diverse or have the school actually gone um, to the point where they're looking to embed um, books that reflect the learners all around the school um, that your child potentially could go to? Let me just move on. Okay. So here are some tweets that are quite recent um, from schools in Glasgow City Council. Excuse me, I'll go back. Um, And these are just some examples of schools that are working to increase that cultural diversity and celebration within their their, um, school catchment. So some schools are um, creating their own books. We have Ramadan being celebrated and celebrated well, learners playing together, having space to enjoy time together while maybe their peers are having food at that point. Um, Celebrating holy, celebrating um, different faiths within the school, creating posters that celebrate diversity. These are all things that are good examples of of schools right now in Glasgow working to increase that cultural awareness and diversity within their own school. So obviously we have our... um, curriculum which is central to everything that happens in schools and these are just a few examples of some of the things that are important um, to make sure that our school is is even looking at the curriculum. It's vital that um, it's not just what's around the school but it's also what we're teaching our learners. So is the curriculum reflecting the cultures of learners in the school? For example if a school is um, looking at um, if a school has perhaps a majority of children who are um, from who are um, from Islam, is it appropriate then that they're not covering that within their religious education? So a lot of schools are looking at how do they balance better the religions that they're looking at and the experiences or outcomes of learners um, in order to tie in better with their local school community. And that, again, is different for every school in Glasgow. Um, but a lot of schools are looking at that at the moment. Um, Black History Month. So for a month, really, is it is it fair that only our, our learners who maybe identify as black are only feeling that they're celebrated for once a month each year? That seems to be very limited. So I suppose the bigger question is, although it's great that there's a focus, why is it confined to a month? So we need to look at our curriculum and lots of schools, again, are doing that. They want their learners to be seen in the curriculum every day, each lesson, all through the year. That our learners are seeing themselves reflected. Um, it's also this, the place that we give BME people in the curriculum. So when we're, like, for example, looking at different sciences or biologists or anything like that, are we always looking at just the traditional white people that we've always heard about in scientific breakthrough? No, we should be now, we should always be looking to include um, our BME scientists, our BME people of note, so that our learners see themselves also reflected in the curriculum. Um, so we're looking at how do we respond to our learners. Are families welcomed at enrolment? So that's a very important one. Again, that comes down to, have you seen yourself, have you seen a language where perhaps at the front door that reflects your experience? Um, are schools able to get interpreters? Are schools um, placing value on interpreters coming as well? It's very important. And I think a lot of schools, again, do this very, very well because we want to ensure that our families are welcomed at enrolment. That's part of um, being culturally aware and culturally responsive. Because we don't want our families to come and have to muddle through. We want our families to, to feel welcome, to have the opportunity to speak to interpreters and to be able to enrol and give all the information that is there about their learner, about their family that they would like to give. Um, and it's also important at enrolment that we collect information around families about language, religion, culture, because it matters to us that we know our learners. And um, really vital if we don't have this kind of basic information about our learners that is very, very difficult to um, to ensure that we're meeting their needs and to ensure that we're supporting families well. So it's looking at curriculum design. That's something a lot of schools are doing right now and doing it very well. 
looking at curriculum design, how do we support schools better? How do we support learners better? How do we support families um, within the curriculum? And actually, how do we welcome families within the school? I suppose all of this ties in with um, the rights of the child. And rights respecting schools is something that's very much promoted within Glasgow, and quite rightly. Um, and it's for not just our learners who don't speak English or who come from another country. Um, these are rights for every child. So that's um, every child that is white, BME, black, whatever a child identifies as. These rights are there for each learner. Um, and right respect to schools promotes cultural diversity and awareness and inclusivity. Um, and cultural awareness prepares learners to live in an interconnected world. And we all know now that with smartphones, computers, the internet, um, I mean, there, there, there's ways of communicating now that are, are quite fascinating. And our learners are growing up within that environment. Um, and so it's really important that they have the cultural awareness to navigate that well. So there are 54 articles that cover all aspects of a child's life that learners are entitled to have. But we sadly know that many young people do not enjoy all of these rights, even at the most basic level regarding shelter, food and water. And we would hope that within you know, our schools that, that our learners are not experiencing that. Um, because we would need to do something about that very quickly. I think it's, it's important to note that without highly developed cultural awareness, young people will not be able to fully navigate um, the world effectively as they learn and as they grow, as they become young adults and, um, and take positions of responsibility in, in the future. Excuse me, I'm going to move this on again. Okay, so... There's 54 rights altogether, but I wanted to highlight four just now um, that really will speak into this important issue of cultural awareness in schools. It's not just because it's a good idea, um, because it is a right. It's a right for the learners, it's a right for families um, to see themselves reflected in the curriculum, to have an opportunity to speak about their culture. I mean, I come from Northern Ireland and even, and I, I'm born in the UK, my, my skin is white. I speak English. That's my first language. But even though I come from, um, even though I live in Scotland, I've lived here a long time, I still identify very strongly as being from Northern Ireland um, and as having my own identity. And we have learners that sit within that kind of context as well. And it's really important that we have the opportunity to express ourselves and to express our own culture. And I, and I say that as an adult you know, as well. And, and I think it's really important when we look at this, we'll see why it's key for our learners. These key articles highlight the learners have a right to education that's culturally aware. So that goes for our learners that are embedded in Scottish culture and have been maybe their whole life, but also for our learners who have maybe come from another culture or maybe several different cultures, as we'll find out more um, through this presentation. Glasgow City Council pr promotes rights respecting school award. Um, so that's where schools are, are measured on their um, impact to do with um, cultural awareness and the rights of the child and um it's a really key award that is within Glasgow just now and a lot of schools are doing this. And I think, again, this could be why you should see a lot of things we're talking about today happening in Glasgow. Very, very important that schools respond and become culturally responsive and culturally competent. And a lot of schools are working towards that. Um, so I just want to highlight these uh, four main articles tonight. So the first one, uh, I'm going to start at number 30, actually, at the top of the page. It's slightly out of order. Um, children have the right to use their own language, culture and religion, even if these are not shared by most people in the country where they live. So again, that applies to lots of our learners in Glasgow. And I've already said, you know, 25% of the learners in Glasgow are categorised as, sorry, EAL. So their English is an additional language, it's not their first language. So if we just take language, for example, not even religion, that shows us that we have, you know, almost 18,000 learners that, that for who it's a right to use their own language. Um, Every child has the right to rest, play and take part in cultural and creative activities. So again, that's all our learners in the city and there's something like 78,000 learners in the city that have a right to this. Um, number 29, children's education should help them fully develop their personalities, talents and abilities. It should teach them to understand their own rights and to respect other people's rights, cultures and differences. It should help them to live peacefully and protect the environment. And again, that comes down to how do we... Um, support our learners, not every learner, to become um, culturally competent, culturally aware in order to survive in what is, what is a very interconnect interconnected world and is becoming even more so. Um, and the final one, which is the, sorry, the two that probably should have gone at the start. Um, 
no matter where they are, where they live, what language they speak, what religion they are, what they think, what they look like, if they're a boy or a girl, if they have a disability, if they're rich or poor, and no matter who their parents or families are, or what their pa- parents or families believe or do, no child should be treated unfairly for any reason. And I, and I think that's a really key one, um, where actually it's about um, making sure that no one's discriminated against because of their religion or what they look like or how they speak um, or their gender. And again, we want our learners to be able to fully understand that these are rights and that this is something that they should expect within their school community. And it's also something parents should see. No bother. Okay, so we're just um, going to move on and uh, think about um, our... Oh, sorry. What? Um, think Goodbye. about the, the, the people that we work with within uh, the, the parent council groups and things like that and just thinking about ways that we might interact um, with um, some of our more diverse families. And to start off with that, we're going to think about like the language that we use, just even when we're referring um, to people from other cultures and uh, from um, other countries as well. Um, so what we need to think about is the terms that we use when we're, we're, we're describing um, people. And we need to make sure that these terms are empowering um, for people. Um, and we need to remember that um, the attention that we have behind the word and the people's preference of what terms um, are used um, can change as well. So um, I recently worked with some um, young people um, from the high schools and we, we held up a lot of these terms and um, <clears throat> we asked them what they preferred to be like to be used um, to, to describe um, their ethnic group or whatever. And there was a real mix. There was some some people preferred um, just to be referred to as black. Some people prefer BME, and it, it really made a um, it, it was really quite eye opening to see that there isn't one actual preferred term um, that 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 seems to be preferred by by everyone. So you can see here, there's 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 a whole load of different terms to think about. So um, there's a uh, black and minority ethnic, black Asian and minority ethnic. Um, EL is a term obviously we, we use for the uh, um, our, our bilingual learners who have English as an additional language. BPOP is a black person or a person of colour. And then we've got the new Scot asylum seekers and um, refugees who are settling in Scotland. And <clears throat> when you have conversations um, with with people of colour, it, it's it's quite obvious that there is there is preferences that, that, that some people prefer to be referred to. For example, um, we've, we've got a colleague who doesn't like to be referred to as a BME person because her she, she's Asian, so she doesn't see herself as a black person, so she prefers BAME. So I think what we have to remember is, is that if, if you're not sure what term to use, then it, it's, it's better to ask than either use the wrong term or just avoid using it at all, because sometimes that's even worse. It can, you know, it can just cause discomfort for everyone that's kind of involved in the conversation or whatever. So sometimes it's better just to just to say, I'm, I'm going to use this term, is this term okay or whatever. Um, and it's it's often our own discomfort that holds us back from using the correct terms um, for white people, I mean, because we're we're often too worried about upsetting people. And really what we should do is, is use a term and if someone is not particularly happy with it, then apologise and ask like what, what they would prefer. They're from an Indian background. Um, their family speaks Punjabi, um, but this is them thinking about their own perspective, about their culture and their identity, and and how they they see themselves um, as as a, a person in Scotland, um, a person of colour in Scotland. Um, so, I think the "Don't speak to me in Punjabi" was uh, really referring to. I think tell me if I'm wrong, Jane, that uh, maybe when um, she was getting a bit older and she didn't want her family yeah. to speak to her in Punjabi, which we see with a lot of our learners. To be honest with you, a lot of our learners come. Um, from other countries and they become speaking their home language or they might have even be, be second or third generation families who have, have been brought up speaking their home language but then once they come into school and they start learning English they, they prefer to respond to their parents um, in English and they prefer to use English more often and I th- that, that is a, a, a change that we see um, with a lot of our, our young people however that doesn't make them feel any less connected to the, their home um, country or culture it's just, I think for a lot of them, it's just their way of trying to fit in. Um, I'm not sure about that second one, Jane, about the uni days. Oh, so this was, a, so our colleague had been to a school where everyone was white and no one spoke her language. And when she went to university, she said that all of a sudden she started to find herself deviate to people 
who looked like her and were able to speak her language when she'd never had the opportunity before. Oh, okay. Okay. And then <clears throat> I'm thinking as well about the one with your culture is not as strict. Um, she's Sikh, and I think um, in comparison um, with some of the other um, Asian, Asian religion, sorry, yeah. can't speak to the other Asian religions, sometimes there's a comparison being made mm -hmm. between those, those religions about one religion being a, like more strict than others and things like that. And you know, when people make that comparison and then think about lifestyle choices and things um, depending on that, which again is assumptions that people um, really, really shouldn't be making. Again, Jane, I'm a wee bit unsure about the four of us. <laughs> no, it's okay. So again, <laughs> she she was living in Birmingham for a time and when she was a young person and her mum, who was who is BME as well, was actively scared of black men who had dreads and was um was encouraging her children to be scared as well. And my friend would acknowledge now and has spoken to her mum since and said, Mum, you didn't understand their culture. And, and you were afraid of something that wasn't real. Um, uh -huh. That mm -hmm. was her kind of uh, response to that now as an adult. And then the bottom three, Christine, are her son's recent experiences and questions to her. Okay, so I can I can see that as well because um, the colleague that we're talking about, she has a very Scottish accent and she's mm -hmm. she's been here pretty much her whole life. And, and she, she, I mean, yeah. And so I think her son, it, it can be maybe quite confusing for some of the young people, um, you know, because... She, she does live a very Western lifestyle and things like that. And so I think probably he's, he is asking and she doesn't always speak Punjabi or whatever at home with them. I think she does sometimes, but he also prefers to speak in English as well. So it, it can take a while for you, for, um, for people to kind of, you know, determine where they sit within their culture as well. And it, I can't find the correct colour for my skin. We, we see this with a lot of our, our young people. I mean, there's, there's certain... Um, art tools and things that you can buy certain pens and things but they're, they're more expensive and things like that and so it can it, it can be quite people uh, quite difficult for young people to relate to their culture if they're drawn just drawing themselves and then but if they're not able to truly actually draw a, a proper representation of themselves because they don't have the correct tools in a lot of the classrooms to try and draw a reflection of themselves in um in, in their work and things and then finally, the last one, this, I'm Scottish, but I know the next question will be, but what are you really? And we know that this is a, a question that a lot of our bilingual families, whether they've been here for a long time, whether they, they, were, they were born here in their second, third, fourth generation families or newer arrivals, that question comes, you know, with the assumption that, yeah, you, you know, you maybe got a different colour of skin or you've got an accent when you speak, so you, you, you're not regarded as a Scottish person. And, and that can be quite offensive for a lot of people just to make that assumption because a lot of um, our families, like with, when we were looking back at the last slide and thinking about the new Scots, that, that's a policy that, that obviously the government is trying to put in, that everyone is welcome here, but really that there's, there's an undertone that actually they're not new Scots just yet. They're still regarded as something else and they're still being, you know, having these conversations about, you know, well, you might be from, you know, Brother Glen, but where are you really from kind of thing? And so, and that's something that um, we need to think about when we're speaking uh, to people from other cultures and countries, just to ensure that we're not offending people in, uh, when we're, we're asking these questions. Yeah. So just um, like you were saying about um, how it can take a bit of time um, just to, to see where people sit within their culture and, um, <clears throat> and within their identity. We we'll look at that a wee bit further here when we think about the balance of identity. And it is a complex relationship because they're trying to fit in at school. They're trying to find their place within school, but um, a lot of a lot are trying to hold on to their home the home culture as well. And their parents are trying to encourage that as well. Which us as EEL teachers, we completely encourage, especially with trying to hold on to their home language and and things like that. We, we really encourage that because it's it's so important for development of a new language, but also just just for a, a life skill and it's part of their, their identity and everything. So, yeah, it, it's, it's quite a tricky relationship with themselves that they're, they're building up um, uh, while they're here. Um, so some of our young people do identify as being from the country of their parent without ever actually having visited that country. And they can, they can feel a bit confused um, about it. So you can see here, can I be black and Scottish? I was born in Glasgow. But do I say I come from the country of my parents? Um, a lot of our learners don't identify as Scottish. Um, I recently have been doing lessons um, with some P6s in a class and we were talking about 
what does a Scottish person look like? And I was still getting a lot of, you know, the stereotypical Scottish person coming out with, you know, kilt and bagpipes and, and <clears throat> you know, drinking iron brew and eating shortbread and all the rest of it. And when I was trying to speak to all of these young people and saying, well, actually, all of you are, are Scottish. You, you, you can all be considered the Scottish. You live here. You go to school here. You know, you've built up relationships here. And a lot of the responses that I was getting back was, no, I, I, I can't be Scottish because I'm not from here. So obviously it's, it's, it is very confusing to think about, you know, where actually is your home country? And that question came up as well. The third one, how long do I have to live in Scotland before I can call myself Scottish as well? Um, thinking about how they fit in and how, how do I know I'll be accepted? And again, that's where the home language thing often um, comes up where I feel that they'll be more accepted if that they, they're speaking English more often and then what does a real Scottish person look and sound like so that's that again that's like what we were talking about within that class I mean and, and I mean in reality we know that nobody really stoats about wearing a kilt and eating shortbread all the time but even our, our, our monolingual Scottish children were giving me that description as well um, so it, it was quite interesting to see what people see a Scottish person is looking like. Um, but as it says at the bottom, schools that increase their cultural competence have the ability to meaningfully engage families and support effectively. And I think that's really important, that just that cultural understanding. And there's, uh, there is so much going on in schools and there's so much that the young people want to share with their peers about their own cultures. And it helps them, you know, come, uh, you know, understand their identity if they're able to you know, talk talk about their culture more and where they fit within that culture. And so I think schools have to give the opportunity to explore that um, more often. If we go on to the next one, please, Jane. Yep, that's the right one, isn't it? Okay, yeah. So we're just going to move on and think about representation within um, the parent council. So I don't think I need to read um, um, the definition of what a parent council is. I'm Sure, everyone here um, knows what that is. Oh, Jane, you've jumped on. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's just jumping on. Here we go. Um, so, just a few questions there, just for you to think about for your parent council. So, is your school's parent council representative of the learners who attend? Are you aware of the different languages spoken in the school and the different backgrounds of the families? Is that something that the school shares with you? Um, is that is is that is that knowledge that you would have? Is that something you would maybe need to chase up with the school? And are the school events that take place throughout the year, are they culturally responsive? Um, do, do they take into consideration um, the needs um, of the all the different learners that there are in the school? So that, that's 